So in this video we're going to take a look at forces and acceleration and then we'll move on to look at scalars and vectors and we'll finish off by looking at circular motion. Okay, so to start off with, uh, let's talk about the effects that forces can have. So the first thing that a force can affect is the speed of an object. So if a force acts parallel to the direction of an object's travel and in the same direction, it will act to increase the speed and the speed only. It won't cause the direction to change. Whereas, if the force acts parallel but in the opposite direction, it will act to decrease the speed of the object. Uh, but again, it won't change the direction. So, um, that's the scenario in which a force only affects the speed of an object when it's parallel to its motion or parallel to its velocity. You'll often hear it said. Okay. So, the next thing is forces can um, affect the direction of travel of an object. So a specific condition is that if the force acts perpendicular to the, the direction of travel or the perpendicular to the velocity, it will change only the direction and it won't change the speed. So you can see in this scenario here, um, on the left, you can see the, the motion or the velocity is downwards. The force is to the right at 90 degrees. So it makes it travel in a circular path, but it doesn't change its speed. Now, um, so those are very specific conditions, but what happens is if, it, if they're neither parallel nor perpendicular, which will be most of the time, what happens is both the speed and direction objects changes. Um, but these are some specific uh, conditions. Okay, so that's uh, speed and direction. The third thing a force can do is it can act to change the shape of an object. So you can see here the pair of forces. So to change the shape, you need two forces acting in opposite directions, like you can see here. Here we've compressed the object. So if you have two forces equal in magnitude, opposite direction, they will change the shape but not the direction or speed. So it's not going to make it move, but it will, in this case, compress the object. So a good general rule of thumb here to know about is that the more you try and change the shape of an object or um, the harder the object resists changes um, until it actually breaks. So if you're stretching a spring, the longer you stretch it, the more it will resist you stretching it, pulling it back until you actually break that spring. Okay, so we looked at how a force can change the speed of an object, but we can actually have a look in a bit more detail and see how much or how, uh, how quickly the speed changes. So that's what we call acceleration, which is the rate of change of velocity. So the examples we're going to look at to start with are where we have a resultant force in one dimension or one direction. So in this diagram, we can see the forces are in the same direction, so they simply add together. And so we could replace the two forces on that object with the one bigger force like you can see there, which we call the resultant force. Likewise, if we have them in opposite directions, uh, we'd get them cancelling out. So we could replace those two forces with this force of 150 newtons, and it will have exactly the same effect in terms of its speed change, direction change, etc. Okay, so resultant force is one thing that affects acceleration. Bigger force means bigger acceleration. But there's another factor that affects acceleration as well, called inertia. So, a, what Newton's second and first laws tell you is that if there is no resultant force, i.e. when we add up all of the forces like we've seen we're doing here and we get zero, the motion of an object will be unchanged, as in its speed will stay the same, its direction will stay the same, and its shape won't change. Okay, So that's if the resultant force is zero. So... Um, one of the other factors that sort of t 
tells you how much acceleration you get is this idea of inertia or the resistance to change in motion. So objects with larger inertia require bigger resultant forces to produce the same acceleration. And one of the main factors that affects how much inertia an object has is its mass. So think big mass, big inertia, it's really hard to change the motion of the object. That's how I think about it. Okay, so we can put this, these things together into what we call Newton's second law. Uh, so it says that the resultant force is equal to mass times acceleration. So the symbol I use for resultant force is a sigma with an F, so it means the sum of all the forces. We've got M for mass in kilograms, and we've got acceleration in meters per second squared. So we can see that if we have a larger resultant force, that's going to give us a larger acceleration. If you have a larger mass for the same force, that gives you a smaller acceleration. That's what that law really shows you. Okay, so I've been using the word speed and also velocity uh, in here. And I think it's important at this stage that we distinguish the difference uh, because the, the difference between them becomes quite important. Okay, so uh, the difference between velocity and speed and the, the difference between displacement and distance is that one is a vector quantity and one is a scalar. What does that mean? Well, a scalar is something that only has magnitude. It just has a number with a unit, obviously. Uh, but it doesn't tell you any more than that. Whereas a vector quantity has magnitude and direction. So it will, it will tell us both. So uh, distance you will be familiar with. Uh, this is a scalar quantity because we say um, we get stuff like oh, a distance of 20 meters, 5 millimeters or 10 miles. We just get a number with the unit but we've got no more information than that. We, um, we could have gone in any direction. Displacement is the vector equivalent so displacement comes with it a direction so 20 meters left or at 5 degrees to the vertical or 10 miles east. So we can, we've still got the magnitude or the size of it, but we've also got these directions telling you specifically which way that you've gone. And it's the same kind of story with speed. So speed, we just get numbers with units. Velocities have directions with them as well. So it's a, it's a more specific look about how an object is traveling. So once we start dealing with vectors, they follow some rules we call the rules of vector addition. So if we have two or more vectors, to be able to calculate the overall effect of those vectors, what we have to do is add them together. And I'll show you how this works. So the first thing to point out here is we're going to arrange them tip to tail which I'll show you what that means in a second. And you can only add vectors the same unit. So you can add force vectors together. You can add velocity vectors together. But you can't add a force and a velocity. That doesn't work. So here's an object which has got two forces acting on it. And they're acting in different directions. Uh, so they're not easy to immediately work out uh, what the resultant force is here. So what we do is we form what we call the force parallelogram and we make this by adding them tip to tail. So on the left hand side you can see we put the 5 newton force first and then the 3 newton force. On the right hand side we put the 3 first and then the 5 but you can see they both end up in the same place so it doesn't matter which way round we do it. So this is our force parallelogram and our resultant force is the red one that goes from the start to the end. This is the force which has the same effect as the 5 and the 3 newtons do. And what we also would want to know is what direction that's in. So I'm going to give the angle to the 5 newton forces which I've called x. Okay, so the scale I've used is that 1 centimeter equals 2 newtons. So the 5 newton force is actually 2.5 centimeters on my diagram. The 3 newton force is 1.5 centimeters on the diagram. So everything is done to scale because that then will allow us to measure the resultant force and also measure the angle. So I am just literally measuring the length of this arrow, so I reckon the resultant force, or R, is 4 centimetres, which means it's 8 newtons in total. And then X, I again just measure with a protractor, it's at 11 degrees to the 5 newton force. So I'm not just saying 11 degrees, I'm actually saying 
11 degrees to what? In this case, to the 5 newton force. There would be nothing wrong with giving it to the 3 newton force or the horizontal or anything like that, but that's the example I've chosen. Okay, so what we're going to do now is actually put kind of put all of those things together and talk about objects in circular motion. So the first thing, let's be clear, what do we mean by circular motion, or to give it its full name, uniform circular motion? So it's an object travelling at constant speed with the resultant force always directed towards the centre of the circular path. Uh, so what does... Uh, like a, a term you often hear with circular motion is centripetal force, or to give it its full name, centripetal resultant force. And what that tells you is the direction, so it means the resultant force is directed towards the centre of the circular path. So when you see centripetal force, it means resultant force directed towards the centre of the circular path. So a thing to make clear is centripetal is not a new type of force. The word centripetal just tells you the direction of the resultant force, i.e. it's towards the centre. Um, like centripetal literally in uh, means center seeking as a translation uh, so all it's doing is telling you direction it's not a new type of force okay so let's see a few examples of where circular motion is useful for modeling uh, so the first one would be the planets orbiting the sun they're not quite circles but they're close enough to circles that it gives us a good model for how they behave so you can see the planet's velocity is given by the red line and we can see the gravitational force uh, between the sun and the planet acts towards the center where the sun is um, so it's always acting towards the center so the planet travels at the same speed but going around in a circular path another example is when you're turning a corner um, so in this case friction between the tires and the road causes a resultant force which is directed towards the center of the circular path so again we've got another example of where we uh, obey the laws of circular motion there um, but this is where i'm going to stop with this video and the next video i'm going to go on to will look at the principles of conservation of energy